Amen. Who said that's right? That's right. Amen. Thank you. Good. Good. I'll tune it in, I promise. That was great. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Stories Jesus told, part whatever it is this morning. Today it's a story about stuff. In uh, 47 years of marriage and uh, 38 years of ministry, I have discovered one thing that's absolutely certain about married couples. They have a distinction always, and people think, well, that primary distinction is one's an extrovert, one's an introvert. Eh, maybe one likes violin, one likes tennis. Eh, maybe one likes the country, one likes the city. Sure, but the real big distinction, inevitably, in married couples I have found is that one is a keeper and one is a thrower away person. And uh, if, if you're a bit of a keeper and you live with a throw-it-away person, it's really quite unnerving, the uh, temerity of these people like my wife. If anything sits on the kitchen counter in our house more than 35 seconds, it's gone. I mean, you put down your keys, you put down your cell phone. Where's the, where's the phone? I put it away. Where? I mean, like one time I took a nap after church, I woke up in the dumpster. And there's just something about this girl, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's like she's afraid of, she says, you have a problem with stuff creep. And uh, I, she told me the other day, she actually said to me, she planned my funeral already and it was going to be a pretty cheap date because she's going to bury me in a little old red car with all my stuff. <laughs> Laptops that have died long ago, putters, thousands of pens everywhere we go. We, I never go to a hotel without ripping off two or three pens. If I'm going to give them 150 bucks, I want a couple of pens out of the deal. So anyway, she, everything I bring, she tosses out. I go out in the, in the, the recycle thing, and I take stuff out of there. And I, I hide it in the garage. So anyway, today, however, we're going to hear from the Lord Jesus a rather unsettling message about having too much stuff. Not us, but most people. Would you stand for our moment of learning together, please? Actually, it's, it's a lesson in, with implications about wealth, the accumulation of wealth, the acquisition of stuff. I mean, let's face it. Let's not kid ourselves. When Jesus talks about the rich, he's talking about us. We live better than 95, 96% of the world. And we're not ashamed of that, nor is he unhappy with it, but we have to be cautious. So we say, what does the Word of God say about the accumulation of wealth? And our reply will be from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Interesting statement here. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which is a very interesting suggested piece of theology there that wealth isn't necessarily something about which we should feel ashamed. God often blesses with wealth as a confirmation of his blessings, but we must be careful with the wealth and what we do with it. And yes, that's the Old Testament, but Jesus never contradicted the Old Testament covenants. So again, the question is, what does the Word of God say about the accumulation of wealth? Together, please. Remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms His covenant. Thank you, Pastor Larson. Pastor's message today is part of the series, Stories Jesus Told, Part 5. It's entitled, A Rich Fool. It's taken from the text of Luke Chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Luke 12, starting at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. This is the, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
years ago, I heard an excellent sermon. The title of it was Mr. Vigor Barnes. It really stayed with me. Jesus called that guy a fool. It is an interesting passage, is it not? Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Well, it's a perfectly reasonable request, isn't it? I mean, Jesus happens to be the Son of God, the Christ having taken on flesh, the one who will mediate between man, woman, sinner, and God, the divine, eternal Son. While you happen to be here, Jesus, could we ask you to just look in on something for a minute? There's a small dispute between my brother and me. And Jesus said, no, actually, no, I'm not here to do that. Nobody appointed me a judge or an arbiter between the two of you. That's not why I'm here. I don't want to do it. We don't know what happened. <laughs> we don't know what became of their dispute. But it's a fascinating reply. It seems a small thing to ask, unless it was communication on the part of Jesus that he did not care to have his task, shall we say, obscured or obfuscated with something as mundane as your inheritance question. He said, no, I'm not doing it. It's not what I'm about, which should prompt a question from us. What is he then about? Why did Jesus come? What story does he tell us today? Let's pray before we proceed, and so we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercies. We pray for the person here who doesn't know you. Well, they're here, though. We hope that if they're outside of the kingdom but looking in, we pray you draw them into yourself. Their heart would be opened and softened. We pray for ourselves who belong to you, but we are reminded of this important statement. We don't want to feel condemnation, nor do we sense that's what's coming our way, but we are certainly reminded by what you have said. Now, Jesus, we pray in your name for a blessing. And when I say something not helpful in your sight, as I certainly will, I pray you would bring it to nothing and quickly. We ask because of Christ. Amen. A year ago, last October 2015, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about investing, as there often is in the journal, and it talked about the boom investment that is to be found in an unlikely area. It suggested that with money in our pockets, what we really should do is invest in a certain thing, and they did not mean the automobile industry. They didn't mean high tech. They didn't mean theater. They didn't mean entertainment. They weren't talking about the market in any sense or any other kind of commodity. The hottest investment that's out there on the horizon, said the Wall Street Journal, is storage units. <laughs> They're well on their way to a million storage units, apparently, in America. In fact, they focused on an organization, a business in Southern California that has so many of them, they have a whole array of teams just managing their units, and they are currently adding 3.9 million square feet just in one location. That is 84 acres of storage units. Now, this church and this little campus sit on 27 or 28 acres. I want you to multiply that by three. Picture all of that space just for Aunt Alice's dishes and whatever else we're putting in those storage units. And they're building more than 1,000 new storage units, or not just units, individual units, but complexes each year across America. How much stuff can we possibly have? Now, people here among us have used storage units in between moves. Kids come home from college. I got it. There's some value there. But do we really need that many storage units in our lives? And is it possible that it's time for us again to hear that Jesus came to show us something far greater and more important? Because the real thing that is on the mind of Jesus is the stress that is coming, and he's telling his own, be ready, and if you're not careful, you won't be ready, because your mind will be so filled up with the world and your stuff that you'll be spiritually dry, you'll be spiritually flabby, if you will. You will spend so much of your energy and me with you, accumulating your stuff, maintaining and guarding your stuff, that when the time comes for the great distress, you will not be prepared. Jesus' whole orientation is on the future and what is coming. In fact, at one point in Luke 21, he said, be careful. Your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, anxieties of life. That day, whenever he says that day, he means the final day. He says it a half dozen times, that day, that day, that day. They'll close on you like a trap. And one of you will say to me, I understand, listen, I have no problem with drinking. What's this dissipation and drunkenness thing? Dissipation is a word that means exhaustion from indulgence. You can say, well, I don't have a drinking problem. Okay, fine, I don't either. 
What he's saying is you can so indulge in the world and its stuff and its provisions and its temptations. I mean, every single week you get another offer from somebody to trade in your cell phone to get a better one because it beeps instead of bops or something. There's no end to this. And he's saying that when you indulge that much, your, your mind is everywhere. You have too much stuff, too much time, too many commitments. And life is not about all of that. There's no condemnation here. Just a good reminder that even Christians can experience life's hangovers. You would say, well, no, pastor, be careful. Hangovers come from too much drinking. Hangovers come from too much stuff and too much busyness. He said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a crop. A life that is driven by possessions is an idolatrous life. What would you do, what would I do, if you lost everything in the next 24 hours? A lot of years ago, J. Christie Wilson and his wife Betty were missionaries in Afghanistan. I knew Dr. Wilson, had the privilege of having him as a mentor when I was a seminarian. Before he went to the Lord a lot of years ago, he spoke right here from our pulpit. He and his wife were just great people, just great people to just be with. Had an interesting thing happen when he was in Afghanistan in the 60s and 70s. They planted a church in a Muslim area where there were no Christians and they began to see people come to Christ again and again. They were very popular. They also were teachers of English and other things, very brilliant people. But one day the regional governor called him in and said, I understand, I have just realized you've planted a church here and you are to leave our country. You have 24 hours to be out. They discussed it, but to no avail. They were given 24 hours. Now, they'd lived there for a number of years. They raised a couple of kids there. They had a little house. They had possessions. They had a beautiful library. They had some furnishings, things of consequence that we all enjoy. They went home, they prayed, and they decided that they'd use their 24 hours to go and visit everyone they had won to the Lord and pray with them and have a good departure from them. And they would leave all their stuff. They could use the 24 hours to pack all their belongings they could leave their belongings and visit everyone and pray. And that's what they did. And they arrived in Massachusetts about a week after that with nothing except their Bibles, their clothing, a couple of dollars, and a few little things in a bag. Would I do that? If I didn't do that, I'd stay saved. Where is my mind? Where is my heart? Where are my priorities? What would you do in that situation? That's a good question. A lot of times in the Christian life, we are prompted to ask questions. So Jesus tells the story about a man who asked himself a question, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he had lots of crops, and he was already affluent. Oh, well, here's what I'll do, I'll, I'll build a bigger barn. I'll tear down my barns, I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. It seems to have never occurred to him to give away the excess. It seems to have never occurred to him to calculate what he needed to live on reasonably, comfortably, fine. Being poor is no fun. Got it. Why didn't he just do some math and say, look at all this blessing I can be. There are people who are poor. There are people who need medical care. There are people who, whose kids would like to go to school, but they don't have a nickel. And some of them deserve it, and they've been lazy. Well, maybe that what they need is a hand up and a lecture about laziness. But in any case, what will I do with my excess? You see, I would be ashamed of this place and its beauty over the years. If we had not, by God's grace, put up more than $20 million in the last 25 years to missions and to needs around the world, I would be ashamed to be in this place if that was not the case. And by the way, that's what keeps us afloat. I am not boasting before the Lord. By God's grace, we have been blessed. Our question shall be, what shall I do? How can I bless? Jesus didn't come to condemn wealth. Not at all. He's talking about what we should do with it. Now, there's no line to be drawn here, by the way. There's nothing, I don't have a handout on this that says, okay, if your net worth is more than X amount, you've got too much net worth, not doing that. You gotta work that out. I gotta work it out. But I love that story about a guy named Bill who went off to Yale University. It was 1915 when he went. Bill was a very bright guy, terrific athlete, a scholar, kind of guy everybody liked. Bill lived very modestly. In fact, he was kind of the campus joke because he 
didn't have a wagon or any of those newfangled cars. He rode a bicycle to class. He lived very modestly, borrowed books when he could. And um, Bill was kind of a well-liked kook, people thought. He finished his studies, and he went off to Princeton Seminary, which in those days was an evangelical school. And then Bill went onto the mission field in China. And you would think a guy who loved the Lord that much and had given himself over to all of these kinds of things for the kingdom would be mightily blessed and eternally protected, and yet God allowed Bill to come down with spinal meningitis a few weeks in China, and he died. Astounding story. The kind of thing that makes you want to say, Lord, you know, with all the creepy people out there that don't deserve to live, why would you do this with Bill? But God is God and we are not. Amen? You lose someone, you remember Jesus said, sparrows don't fall unless the Father allows it. So anyway, Bill, his body was shipped home. And at the funeral service, a lot of friends finally put together who Bill was. His name was William Borden III. He was the inheritor of the Borden family dairy fortune. He was a multimillionaire. And it was learned that Bill received checks every month for 100,000 or more from all the investments. And he was building hospitals, churches, schools, supporting the poor, paying tuition for kids who couldn't while he lived that way. And his folks found written in his Bible these words, no reserves and no regrets. Bill understood that his life did not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, this is pretty uncomfortable, isn't it? So what's Pastor Alberta after? Well, we should all take a vow of poverty. No, it doesn't work either. And actually, it's a rare thing when God calls someone to such poverty, some Mother Teresa type or someone else. I think that's the exception, not the rule. Just a reminder, just a reminder, friends, too much on the consumer side, on the stuff side, becomes idolatry. Money can make an idol, an idolater out of anyone, and it can make a fool out of anyone. The guy said, here's what I'll do. You have plenty of good things laid out for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. This is a man whose vision is only in the right now. He only is thinking about today, maybe next week, maybe next year, but he's certainly not thinking about eternity. Now, I have nothing against annuities and planning for retirement. I have one myself, and we're thinking about that these days ourselves. That's all smart. That's just good. But he's only thinking about right now. If there's one message Jesus has for us, it is to stop thinking only about the right now and think on an eternal basis. The difference between the true Christian, someone who walks with Christ, and someone who is worldly is that the, the true Christian is not myopic. Remember that word, myopia? Short-sightedness, nearsightedness. A myopic person can only see what's right in front of them. They're short-sighted. Jesus doesn't want short-sighted disciples. I'll lighten up with you for a minute. I, I've been going to the same eye doctor for 20 plus years. I really like this guy's right in town here. And the last couple of times I've gone, he said to me, yes, your eyes are getting stronger and your prescription has to be weakened. And I said, this is expensive. You know, every time I come in here, I have to ramp it down and start saving all my glasses from years ago because apparently they're like old ties. I'm going back to them, you know? I said, what, how, how much stronger can they get? He said, well, sometimes as you get older, your eyes improve and the little muscles get tweaked. So I said, what's this mean if I live to be 110? He says, if you live to be 110, you're going to have perfect vision even though you don't know what you're looking at. Anyway, anyway, I am, I am, we are generally myopic. We tend to look at what's going on right in front of it. And God comes along and he says, you're a fool, actually. You're myopic. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. I wish I had time to show you the original text there. It's a fascinating word. Your life will be demanded from you. It's a word that means drawn back. See, God owns the soul. I met a little girl last night, a young lady. I went to take pictures of kids for a prom. But one kid said, beautiful girl, tells me she's an atheist. I've talked to her before. I said, you're not an atheist. I am. No, you're not. I am. No, you're not. She said, how would you know if I am? I said, because I know you're not. Because the Bible says there are no atheists. The Bible says in Romans 1 and elsewhere that everybody knows there's a God. Well, she said, I said, God gave you your spirit and he will take it back. Oh, please. She said, you know that, she says to me, oh, Pastor Alberta, you know that there are millions of planets out there. I said, no, there's billions. Actually, there's billions of galaxies. So surely one would show up like this. I said, why do you believe that? Really? You're all prettied up for the dance. Are you that way because there was an explosion at the makeup factory? 
Or do I see evidence of design and deliberate action? Well, yeah. Night, sharp girl. But you have a spirit. And this text says God draws the spirit back. When Bill recently went to the Lord, Lee in Georgia, all that is technically is God draws the spirit back that he initially gave. This very night, your spirit will be drawn from you. Who will get then what you prepared for yourself? You live on a big estate. They call you lordship, and you've got barns next to your barns. And Jesus said elsewhere, what good would this be to gain the whole world but forfeit your very soul yourself? Your debt is to God. There really are no atheists. Solomon said it. We've been looking at this in my Wednesday night class. God has set eternity in the hearts of men, and that's why we're being asked don't forget to go look at the bear. A new person here in the first service asked me, what in the world that big teddy bear is about out there? The bear witness guy. We're supposed to bear witness. Send notes to your neighbors, please, in November. Be praying for your neighbors. Invite them here on the 20th. And if nobody comes, you'll be just like God, who invites people that don't come. You get to experience what God experiences. And some might come. Try not to come to church if you see them and say, gee, you actually came. But reach out. Okay? Because they know there's something going on. There's something eternal in their hearts. There's something eternal in their hearts. We should be storing up treasures in heaven. That's what Jesus is saying to the guy. You're wrangling with your brother over the inheritance. Who gets 2,000? Who gets 5,000? Or whatever it was. Good grief. Why do you fret so much about that? Life's very short. I've told this story before. It's been a while, and most of you forgot or you weren't here. But a few winters ago, Don and I met her mom in Phoenix, where our son uh, JJ and his family live. Because, Ma, uh, because Grandma, Don's mom, Don's mom, 94, has a cousin living in Phoenix that she hasn't seen since 1944, when they graduated from high school. They haven't seen each other for 70 years. So we made arrangements to take, pay, take her to her cousin's home. He's a retired physician, and he's married. He's 90 or 89, or 90. she's 89. They're both retired doctors. And we're going to take Vern, Donna's mom, to see, meet them. And we did. It, my ears hurt for three days. You ever been with really old people? How are you? I thought, oh. This conversation was just basically a shouting match, you know. It was kind of sweet. But it turned out. These people were hoarders. Their house had to, like, hi, have a seat if you can find one. <laughs> Newspapers, broken televisions, magazines, dinner plates uncleaned. The place was, it looked like it needed a whole platoon of molly maids or something. It was a mess. And they were loud. And they were worldly. And they had no idea about the kingdom of God. I think I, you may, some of you may remember. The lady said to me, I understand you're a minister. I said, I yeah. am. What brand? <laughs> what kind are you? I said, I'm a very nice one. She said, yeah, well, what brand? I said, I'm a Presbyterian. She goes, oh. That was exciting. <laughs> so finally, he said, let's go get dinner. I said, let's go get dinner anywhere, please. And then he said, I'm going to take you to a Paraguayan restaurant. That says one thing to me, roll aids. <laughs> I don't want that food, right? Ah, oh, it was terrible. And the guy was a lovely man who ran a little Catholic guy. He had statues everywhere, the Virgin of Guadalupe, the Virgin of uh, New Jersey, the, all these statues. And the guy was a lovely man. He was telling me about his whole life story. He's weeping. I'm eating all this food I can't eat. Anyway, we. I'm making fun, but I'm having fun. Try, we're trying to be a witness. We're trying to tell these people what we do and why we do it. So Donna said, let's pray. So she, you know, if you know Donna, you know, prayer before the meal means cold food. <laughs> so my son's always say, Mom, can we pray after we eat? So anyway, she says this long and beautiful prayer. And I'm holding hands with this little old lady who hasn't been in church like ever. And she, we finished the prayer and she looks at me and says, that was very nice. I have never done that in my whole life. Honestly, Pam, I said, you mean this? Yeah, I said, never done what? You know, held hands and prayed. Unbelievable. We learned that they own stock, they own farms, villages, developments all over America, zillions and gazillions of dollars, 
and no knowledge of God. It was pathetic. We tried to witness. Let me say this. We were home a week when Donna's mom called and said, you know, Cousin Albert died yesterday. I don't know if I said enough. I don't know. Maybe in the final moments, something we said woke him up. Your life doesn't consist in the abundance of your possessions. That's what Jesus said. Man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. But let's make something clear. Well, we all know we have more than enough stuff. But he's not condemning us for that. He's just saying, don't live for the right now. Reach out. He provides. When Christy Wilson and his wife got to Massachusetts, within a week or so, he was given a prominent position as a professor at Gordon Conwell Seminary. A family bought them a beautiful new car. Someone else gave them housing. They filled their lives with furniture and every possible material need. In fact, he said he didn't know what to do with half this stuff. He said, please stop bringing us stuff. God is faithful. He's not unhappy with this stuff, as long as you don't worship this stuff, proving that when we are rich towards heaven, he will make us adequately rich here on earth. Jesus, we pray. I certainly do hope that I don't need to uh, worry about that, that older guy and his wife who had no knowledge of the gospel. I have to believe that you took us there for a purpose, and we did get to share somewhat. We pray, though, together now as, as your own disciples, as your students, as your own children, that we would appreciate all that you have provided, we would be blessed thereby, we would enjoy the provisions, and we would not worship the provisions or become fools in the maintenance of those provisions. And give us generous hearts. And if anyone here has something pop in their investments and suddenly they have five million extra dollars, including me, let us not say, now what can I do for myself? I'll build an even bigger barn and buy three more cars. Give us generous hearts, Jesus, for we pray in your name.